You know, when you look at a field like uh, genetics, there uh, have been explosive developments over the last few decades. Geology is something we tend to think hasn't changed that much. Uh, what have been some of the, the big shifts that you've seen? I think in the broader understanding of Earth as it behaves today, you know, this theory of plate tectonics, was a, which was a real uh, revolution when it came in in the 60s, because there's, there's all this data about uh, how the Earth works, and uh, there's a lot of information out there, but it never been pulled together, mm. and it was like a paradigm, something that comes along and it uh, just sweeps up all the information before it. And then there's also been uh, the dating of things. We can now much more precisely date episodes in Earth history. So you've got this powerful model, plate tectonics, which says how the Earth has evolved, and then you've got a means of dating it. And then the other thing that's happened is, is pure technology. Um, we've now got instruments where we can see deep below the Earth floor, the drilling techniques are better. So there's been this profound uh, revolution in uh, understanding the deep interior of the Earth, the way in which the Earth's surface reflects that, and then the changes in the continents uh, through time. And, and well, I mean, it's the guiding principle in the geologic series. Uh, plate tectonics drives. It's like evolution is to biology, then, a really fundamental concept that... Uh, I would say the plate tectonic revolution of the late 60s was, was comparable to Darwin's idea of evolution. It's, it's almost like a grand composite theory which you can almost hang anything on. And uh, what I'm really interested in is, is the, uh, the synthesis that is now coming out between mm. biology and geology because it turns out that, as not unexpectedly, Earth's life history uh, relates very well to the biologic history because yes. you're changing the geography, you're changing where oceans are, oceans are coming and going, land masses are migrating into higher and low latitudes. So, you know, it's not uh, a big surprise that the biological record tracks that as well. Was Toronto, Canada's Tuzo Wilson, as big a figure in that whole kind of revolution as we, yeah, we tend to say? Absolutely, uh -huh. yes. There was a lot of uh, diverse information that people had uh, assembled over basically the last hundred years. And it had always been this idea that the continents had been together. I mean, it's a very old idea, right. actually, almost 17th century. And the evidence for it is, is much better in the southern hemisphere. The, the matches between South America, Africa, Australia are actually better. Mm -hmm. And, um, but nobody really believed it. And then people started going across the oceans in boats. They started looking at the character of the ocean floor and that's where the secret was because you saw evidence of volcanoes along the mid-ocean ridges and evidence that the oceans were widening. And really it was mm -hmm. the, the better understanding of the ocean floors and the life history of oceans. Well, I think that's a dramatic thing is suddenly you've got these fossil records high up on mountains and uh, yeah. And, and the interesting thing is the geology of the continents is complicated. And geologists have been wandering around over the continents with all this detail and, not, and frankly not making a lot of sense of it. And then the few geophysicists went across the oceans and suddenly all that, that detail uh, was resolved into this grand cycle of the supercontinent cycle. It's like chapters, you know, you get these big supercontinents, they're unstable, they break up, and we're in a phase now where the continents are moving apart, but they're moving apart to the next meeting. Right. So you can look into the future, you can predict the future quite easily. There's an awful lot of uh, pressure these days on scientists to be relevant. What's the use of supporting this research if it doesn't pay off in some way? How do you say that to someone in the area of geology? What's the relevance of geology? Well, I think it's relevant on a number of different levels. One, the obvious one is resources. We're, we're running out of resources as, as humans, and we've got to explore deeper in the earth, uh, places where we haven't been before, and uh, we might end up using robots uh, to mine deep down in the earth's crust. So there's always that need for resources. Uh, there's also a need to understand where we came from, that's highly relevant, that's science, to understand the history of the planet and our place in it better. And then there's also a huge drive at the moment in terms of relevance, using geological principles to, to better understand the environment so we can look at impacts of cities, uh, of waste disposal, finding resources. But also I think emerging now more than ever is, is the greater risk to human populations posed by geologic processes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, they've always been there. 
but now humans are concentrated more and more in these bigger urban areas. So we need to understand those natural geologic phenomena uh, much better. So I think resources and security and safety are mm -hmm. the two big pushes. Well, of course, you know, in, in the area I'm in, uh, one of our biggest uh, battles is, is about mining because mining is uh, inherently unsustainable. And of course, given geological time, the earth can absorb and deal with a lot of things. But in the short run, the way we're mining is always very problematic. So I'm glad that geology itself as a discipline deals with that because it's the oh, yes. opposite side of exploiting the resources. Yeah, I think we've got to find the resources and that's where new techniques, new instruments come in because they're hidden from view. And, and there is a company that's now trying to mine or at least drill down to the mantle. Uh, so just imagine if we can tap into the mantle and the lower crust. We, I wouldn't say we'd solve our resource problems, but we're getting there. And then the other side of the coin is we've got to get that stuff out in a more environmentally responsible manner. And I, as a geologist, I'll be the first to admit we haven't done very well in the past. Uh, but we're getting there. There's mm -hmm. an awful lot of really good science now that's been uh, directed at finding resources and using them much more sensibly. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think we're, turning the, we're turning the corner. Well, of course, as uh, someone involved in environmental issues and the worry about climate change, the thing I see that you've got down there is energy. Yeah. I mean, if there are ways that geologists can show us to get down there, you know, hot rocks and all that, right. there's a potential for limitless energy, yeah. basically. I, I agree. I think that's very exciting. And it's uh, a technological milestone that we've got to overcome. And like everything else, it's just a case of money. If mm -hmm. somebody would direct a large enough amount of money to drilling down to 10 kilometers and so on, you, you could solve the world's energy problem. And uh, it's done locally in places like Iceland, Kenya. There's actually quite right. a bit of You've got to get, get close enough to the surface yeah. to make it. Or deep enough. Yeah. So, student watches you, gets all excited, goes to university, gets a degree in geology, then what? Well, the resource industry is huge and, and we have this issue at the moment because geology has a bad reputation <laughs> um, for environmentalists that we, we're not producing enough geologists. So there's, a, there's a, a ready job for anybody that has a degree in geology. And then the environmental side, the other side of the coin is that uh, large cities dispose of wastes. Uh, think of all the groundwater that's needed. Uh, what do we do with wastewater? So there's now a huge demand for geoscience, a sort of broader aspect of geology, in the environmental industry, working with biologists, working with physicists and chemists. So geology has changed. It's, it's not just about rocks and minerals but it's about trying to understand uh, the deeper structure of the earth, below cities, aggregate extraction, we need resources in cities and so on, um, and waste disposal. So there's, there's lots of career opportunities and then there's of course research. You can always go to a university and do another degree and uh, try and understand the planet. Uh, it's the only opportunity you have. You know, you, you're a global citizen nowadays, so what, what better uh, career could there be than trying to understand how our planet works and has worked. Not many scientists in your position uh, have devoted the amount of time that you have in the media to get the information you know out to uh, a broader public. What do you feel you've learned from that experience? Oh, I learned a lot myself, personally. Um, I got to go to a lot of interesting places which I wouldn't normally have done, so my understanding of this fantastic place that we call home is, is, is much more extensive than it was, but also I think uh, more fundamentally uh, I learned how to teach and communicate and I, I see this whole four-year exercise as basically a lesson in teaching. It's that you, you're trying to get the message across to a much bigger audience and uh, on every day teaching in the university I use this series and, and the various travels that we had, and the people that we met, uh, as a vehicle uh, to get over the hard science. If, if I go into a lecture room and just present hard science, I find that turns people off quicker than anything. Um, geology, it's about rocks and minerals, right? And that, that image puts a lot of people off. But what I do now is I take them literally on a, on a planetary journey we went to 23 different countries, met an awful lot of interesting people living in some really dangerous places. And so I use that journey to hang the science on. 
And I say, well, this week we're going to go to Japan, look at the tectonic setting of Japan. And I see light bulbs going off in the audience because you, you've immediately made that connection, Japan. And uh, you tell them something about the people living there, the culture. And then very gently you get the science in. You get the rocks and minerals in. And they, they, they love it. If you went it the other way around, if you started with the rocks and minerals, you'd put the audience off. And I think that's been the problem mm. with, with a lot of geology teaching. Uh, in high schools and so on. So I see this series as really a, a way to almost reposition my, my science uh, out there in, in the broader educational realm. So, you know, it's interesting. This is the 50th anniversary of the nature of Congratulations. things. Congratulations. And, uh, well, I'm not responsible, but uh, in, in that time, geology has been an area. You know, I've been associated with it for 30 some odd years, and I kept saying, I love geology. Yeah. and the it was always an idea we danced around because yeah. it was rocks right and what i see the huge shift in the geologic journey the two yeah. both the series yeah. is computer animation yeah you actually are able to speed up that old, yeah. old process in a way that wasn't possible yeah. in the past that's really been huge. yeah I, I think you put your finger on something called time and I think you know you don't have to become a geologist professional geologist but I think you need to do a geology course to claim to be an educated person so I, I see this series going out to the schools and what you're doing is changing people's lives because they'll never see the planet in the same way uh, we've got four and a half billion years to deal with and then the Big Bang was 13 and a half billion years before that so I think when you're trying to get your mind around those big numbers and uh, the very brief existence that we've been on on planet Earth, I think that's that's pretty profound stuff. That's about as profound as it as it gets.